We started off uh, with the uh, Hunter Killer sequence first, Future War sequence. We first built a three foot platform, which uh, all the miniatures would be shot on. And in the background were cutouts of, of ruined cities and in the foregrounds you had ruined buildings and skulls and things of that, that nature. We forced the perspective a lot because to have the distance that appeared there, they have to have far larger stages and distance so that the backgrounds were generally a smaller scale with, with cutouts and usually foam core or cardboard in some cases just to make the silhouettes for the backlight. The skulls that the HK rolls over were, you know, about this big. And also in some of those shots we, we had a larger scale in the foreground like shooting across a, a skull that was right in the foreground. Something I, I couldn't do with one of these little ones and still hold the depth of field. Gene is a master of, of forced perspective photography and uh, with a full-size human skull in the foreground and little skulls no further than a foot away it gives it the illusion like they're there's a ton of them, first of all, but it's real skulls. One of the problems with that is that you're in on many of those close shots where on wide lenses that a lot of handheld work where I'd be in within four, five, six inches away from the models shooting high speed at, at generally, I mean, anywhere from 80 to 120 frames a second. The sets were very hot. We had to have lights really pounding in there in order to maintain focus and depth of field so that it didn't appear to be miniatures, you had to have a real high light level. When it came to building these Hunter Killer tanks, we literally built them from the ground up, meaning that once the treads were finished, then we'd go in and shoot those scenes, and then a portion of the body, we'd shoot those scenes, and then eventually the top uh, section, and then the head was, was radio controlled. It had to be built in, in stages because there wasn't any time and we, we had to start shooting right away because of a lot of scenes that required opticals, the lasers. Jim had a you know, vision of what he wanted the laser to look like and not just a, just a single line that glowed. He wanted them to have a lot of depth, complexity. He had a color that he was really working for. An awful lot had to go through an optical to put the lasers on. Most of the um, uh, searchlights, though, were actually accomplished on set within the smoky environment we had. Smoking up the stage was to uh, hide basically the cutouts in the back uh, that because the set was forced perspective. Um, the entire depth of the set was approximately maybe 16, 18 feet. So we had to give it distance and the way to do that is to create this atmospheric haze over the entire set to give it scale. We used a lot of the cracker smoke, but also we were still occasionally using when we needed it thicker. Um, Gummo labanum, which is a bee smoker thing that you actually burn charcoal. And if you're Catholic, you know what the smell smells like. <laughs> We'd be sucking in this smoke every single day, and it was as hot as hell out there in Burbank during the summer. The, the grenade that goes underneath the uh, tank treads was just a two inch little set piece and to try and get it to go directly underneath the treads was a was a pain in the ass. <laughs> I think we got it on on the 26th take. You wanted the, the explosions to have a lot of energy and punch. The nucleus of an explosion is always usually a bright orangish look to it. What I added to this charge were two AG1 General Electric flash bulbs and to create that orangey effect was a orange amber gel over the flash bulbs. I would have the flash bulbs go off first and then the explosion. And what I would do to create a fiery effect was to use, of all things, walnut dust. And walnut dust, once it's atomized, will create a fireball. The uh, Flying HK wasn't also completely built. We built only one, and it was very rough at that. Um, the detail was really on the undercarriage of it. So they had to make cutouts of like the pods on the side and put them on because they needed a shot right away with the Flying HK. So we got away with a, a couple of shots like that. One of the problems that I remember having was how to make it fly and not go back and forth kind of a thing as you're pulling it. So it was all on cables, it was all on uh, piano wire 
that held it up, and we had wires that went off for the uh, the lights that are on the on the side of it. Also, we did a lot of scenes where halfway through the the motor would slow down, and then the whole thing would be jerking back and forth. <laughs> We got through it. it. It turned out okay. Most composites where principals, actors are in, in front of either miniatures or some type of effect are done with either front screen projection or, or rear screen, and both are employed in this. Jim was a, a big uh, advocate of rear screen also, so a lot of those scenes were accomplished first. We, Gene planned it out so that, that we knew exactly what he needed for for the processing shots or the opticals that needed to go into it. Gene is a master at that sort of thing. The tanker truck um, a sequence that blows up at the end was all done full miniature on a, a complete miniature set. There were no uh, composites on that. Jim Cameron originally wanted to blow this a full-size tanker truck up, but he couldn't because where he was shooting it in downtown Los Angeles was in front of the police armory meaning that they had the, all the guns and the ammunition and the police helicopters up on the roof of this building. So what Gene had to do was create the entire atmosphere in miniature, one six scale, in the front parking lot of Fantasy II in Burbank, and then blow up a miniature tanker truck. The end of the explosion had to match what had already been shot 10 days before in principle, because since principle was shot first, you had a the wreckage of the truck on fire and burning, um, and so we had to blow it up and have it end up looking like the wreckage. I have always had the philosophy of chain reaction, stretching out the scene. So when Michael Bean puts in the pipe bomb at the back end of the tanker truck, I envisioned the explosion happening at the back end of the tanker truck rushing towards the cab of the truck instead of one giant explosion. There was a total of 42 separate explosions on the tanker truck. It created a terrific look. The first time we tried this, the gas was loaded, the bombs were loaded, the wiring was all done, the cameras are ready. We've got three cameras on it and we're shooting 120 frames per second. The lights were ready, everything is ready. And what happened was the cable that was attached to the front axle pulled it so hard that it just ripped it out from underneath the cab and there are the wheels and I'd already started setting off the explosion so I had to set it off the rest of the way. Well, best laid plans, you know, you, <laughs> you do everything you can to make something work right. So I set off the rest of the charges, we put it out and there was a, a collective groan amongst everybody on the set. Um, so we then right away started working on another model and two days later we got the shot. And to this day there's a lot of people that still think that it's not a not a model that's only a foot and a half high and eight feet long. We were submitted quite a few samples for possible composers for the film. And needless to say, when you come to music, that's where you literally have no money left. They had a low-budget action picture. That's, that's what it was billed as. So I was like, oh, okay. You know, it wasn't anything I was super excited about. And we had that sit-down talk where the filmmaker tells you, sometimes before he shows you his film, what he feels the film is about and what elements are in it and I'd been through a lot of those talks you know the philosophy and the depth of it and the dream of the filmmaker and then in many cases they show you the picture and you're sitting there going where is that movie where's the movie they were talking about you know it's like is it there I don't see it Oh, there's a little, I understand what he was talking about, there's a little, you know, they're talking about some big concept and there's this one little thing that relates to it, you know. So I sat down and I, I must say, I wasn't cynical, but I, I always was sort of, when, you know, Jim had a lot of big feelings about the film and passion for it, so when he spoke about it, it was very impressive and I'm sort of, part of my brain's going, well, let's see, you know, and I'm watching the film and, you know, ten minutes in I'm going, it's here. Wow, it's really here. What he's talking about is on the screen, you know, the depth of it and the, the mood and the energy of it and the intensity of it. And so I'm sitting going, I gotta do this, gotta do this. So I'm, we're watching the film and I'm, it's mattering more and more to me. And I'm really, you know, sort of feeling vulnerable, like, okay, now, you know, instead of being like, well, let's see, I'm going, oh, please, please, I hope you're gonna hire me for this movie. And there was a point, I guess, where he blows up and I go, if he gets up one more time, I'm leaving. I said it, I thought I was thinking it, and I said it out loud in the room, and then I'm sitting there thinking, I, I can't believe it. I can't believe I said that. I just lost the job. I just got very quiet and watched the rest of the film and figured, okay, well, 
but that's it. Brad really got the idea that this needed to have a percussive driving beat to go with the action of the film. It was the idea of this mechanical man, in a sense, and his heartbeat. He was great because he had no time, he had no money, and we were adding shots all the time in post-production as we'd get them in, um, and it didn't phase him a bit. He did the whole score in his garage. It was a cool garage. I mean, he had a lot of good gear. I had all these individual keyboards, and they had to be played individually. It was all live. Every note is live performed, with the exception of this. I had an Oberheim situation where I could put a little drum machine and a little dirt, 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 dirt. Those things were chained together, but it was their technology. It didn't interface with anything else. So if my Prophet 10 was going boom, 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 and the other thing was going dirt, 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 I had to literally sit there live and change the tempo and try to get them to match. Part of the nature of the score is me trying to get control of the machines. <laughs> While the machines are trying to get control of the people in the movie, I'm sitting here desperately trying to get control of these machines. When they finally get together in the police station, and he's now someone who had been like stalking her, he, they're now, you know, he's, he's taking her and their partners in a sense. I thought, great, and they're escaping. Da da dum 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 dum. You know, they're running out of the police station. And Jim heard that and he said, No way. He said, I don't. He said, That's going to open up a part of the brain of the audience that's sort of emotional and maybe a little intellectual, like, ah, the theme, they're together. You know, it taps a little part of their. He said, I don't want to. I don't want to distract their synapses. I just want them like this. You know, I just want them to go, they're gonna go. You know, you just, so we, the, the music is the same. We just took the theme out. But underneath there was the running of it, you know. And the theme, I just thought, gave it this heroic moment. And he just said, no, no. And I think that in that awareness, he knew exactly why he didn't want the theme there. I hadn't worked with a director that had that level, that was dealing quite on that level. Don't close out, I've got some cool movie extra trivia. One of the most important elements in Darren Aronofsky's The Fountain is its incredible visuals and special effects. Now, when he realised his budget was too small for all the computer graphics he'd need, Aronofsky turned to other ideas. He hired macro photographer Peter Parks. Now, Parks was used to filming microorganisms in 3D, so he applied the same principles to create footage for The Fountain. The incredible effects to portray outer space were done for a mere 140,000, as opposed to the million that CGI would have cost. Do you like my shirt? You can get one for yourself in the shop section under the video.